Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For those of you that are familiar with my channel, you should know by now that simply familiarizing yourself with the Quran and Hadith is one of the best ways to build a strong case for Islam and build a case for the proofs of prophethood of Rasulullah. There are so many gems that are yet to be utilized um, that haven't made their way into the classical works of proofs of prophethood. And the reason is usually due to matters like subtlety. In this video, I'm going to be arguing for something that we should all be open to, which is the fact that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was not the main authority in Islam and that there is a higher authority that's ordering him and commanding him and prohibiting him from doing things. Now, for a Muslim, this isn't really controversial, but for a non-Muslim, this is something that's going to be a bit hard to swallow, but it really shouldn't be when I present to you the evidence. Firstly, there are many reports that indicate that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was being instructed to follow orders. These narrations refer to that individual as Jibril or Gabriel, yes, the angel. Now, that's not a reason for you to dismiss the report because there's nothing really supernatural going on in these reports. You see, the reports don't speak of an angel with wings coming down to the prophet and, and doing something miraculous. They just indicate um, a man who's identified as Jibril being the person instructing the prophet to do certain things. In other words, there's no reason to raise the bar of required evidence higher than it should be. So take this report, for example. Jabr now writes that the prophet, peace be upon him, prayed behind Jibril, and the people prayed behind the prophet, peace be upon him. He did this five times throughout the day in order to teach the people the proper timings of the prayer. This wasn't only limited to religious actions, but it extended to political decisions as well. Aisha narrates that after the Battle of the Trench, that she saw a man that was armed and covered in dust, who ordered the Prophet, peace be upon him, to fight the tribe of Bani Qurayla. Aisha identifies this man as Jibril. Now, wasn't Aisha alone? Anas also bears witness that he saw Jibril on that day. Now, think about that for a minute. The commander-in-chief of the Muslims is being ordered around by some unknown individual. Not only that, but the timings of prayer, which is one of the most important things in Islam, is being stipulated by that same individual. Now, these points alone should be enough for you to accept that the Prophet, peace be upon him, isn't the person that's calling the shots, and he is not acting on his own accord. Now, this person, Jibril, is someone who's seen frequently around the Prophet, peace be upon him. Haratha bin al-Nu'man greeted him one day without even knowing his identity. The Prophet, peace be upon him, later told him that this was Jibreel. Both Aisha and Abu Sa'id reported that Jibreel visited the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he was sick and made supplications for his recovery. Now, we don't know much about the personality of this individual apart from a report in which he says, we do not enter a house in which there is a dog or a picture. The report suggests that he is quite punctual, with the exception of one day in which a puppy was in the house of the messenger, peace be upon him. Yes, it is strange. But what's stranger is that he actually knew that there's a puppy there in the first place, when the Prophet, peace be upon him himself, did not know of it. But since we do know that this individual was at least in the form of a man, can't we just assume that he really was a man? But who could he be? The only name that has ever been associated with this figure is Dihya bin Khalifa al-Kalbi, a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. In one report, Umm Salama mentions that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was speaking to Dihya. The Prophet, peace be upon him, asked her, as if testing her, Who is this? She said, Dihya. Later, the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave a sermon in which he spoke of this person as Jibreel. Umm Salama was shocked because she assumed that it was Dihya. So what exactly is going on here? Was Dihya the person that was calling the shots from behind the scenes? Well, that's unlikely for a number of reasons. The first reason is Dihya isn't really known to be a knowledgeable companion from amongst the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He doesn't really have any faqih statements, never made any religious rulings. Um, in total, he probably has around three hadiths according to Ibn Hazm, even though he lived until the time of Muawiyah. So that would mean that his community didn't really see him as that knowledgeable of an individual. Um, apart from that, he wasn't given any major stations or ranks. Perhaps the only exception was he was uh, leading a battalion in the Battle of Yarmouk. But apart from that, there's not really anything. What you would expect is for Dihya bin Khalif al-Kalbi, if he was the person calling the shots to be perhaps the next caliph of Islam, right? Also, another reason why it cannot be Dihya bin Khalif al-Kalbi is because there are other reports in which this person is not identified as such. 
Omar narrates once we were sitting in the company of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, when there appeared a man dressed in very white clothes and having extraordinarily black hair. No signs of fatigue of journey appeared on him, and he was known to none of us. The man is later on identified as Jibreel. Furthermore, by returning to classical works of Ma'rif al Sahaba or books that compile the names of the companions, um, we do not find anyone identified as this person, either from the Meccan community or from the Medinan community. Perhaps what makes things even more peculiar is this report by Aisha. When she mentions in passing that Jibreel would come in the forms of men, plural, suggesting that the person identified as Jibreel looked different on different occasions. Abu Huraira narrates that a man asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, of the hour, in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, told him of some of the signs. Then the man left. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told the people to call the man back. They left for him and couldn't find him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, that was Jibreel, and he came to teach the people their religion. This report implies that whoever this person was, he wasn't someone that they could easily get a hold of. They couldn't simply track him back home, and they wouldn't be finding him having lunch with his family or asleep. Nor did he seem to have a home in the first place. But what I find most interesting is what we find from the Prophet, peace be upon him, when speaking about the revelation and how it comes to him. He says, and sometimes the angel appears to me in the likeness of a man and talks to me, and I remember what he says. So what do we expect from this? Well, we expect to find reports in which a man is teaching the Prophet, peace be upon him, some of the Qur'an, and we actually do find that. In this report, Ibn Abbas points out that Jibreel would visit him every night of Ramadan to teach him the Qur'an. This in itself was confirmed by Abu Huraira. Ibn Hajar points out that Ismaili's variant explicitly names Jibreel here as well. Ibn Sirin, Abu Huraira's student, confirms this as well in Musannif ibn Abi Shayba. Another fascinating tidbit about this individual who's identified as Jibreel is that he's the same person that was with the Prophet, peace be upon him, from the very start. The same person that taught him, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق, the first words revealed of the Qur'an. And yet, his identity as a man escapes us even though he was with the Prophet, peace be upon him, from the very beginning of the message. So what do we make of this information and what does this mean, especially to non-Muslims? Um, well, at least, for starters, it clarifies some things that may seem strange in the Qur'an, like verses admonishing Muhammad, peace be upon him, for frowning at a blind man, or the verse admonishing him for taking in prisoners of war. Not only that, but he is being threatened within the Qur'an, also, there are several restrictions placed upon the Prophet, peace be upon him, throughout the Qur'an, which wouldn't really make much sense if he wrote it himself. Check out Halabi's video over here for more on that. Now, I'd like to end this video with one final point, which is that the population of Medina at the time was around 20,000. None of them were able to identify who this person was, but instead, they all accepted that this person was not human. Hope you enjoyed the video. I'll catch you guys later. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.